The video you're about to watch is from one of our spirit schools. Please subscribe. Enjoy. Father, we just glorify your awesome name. Thank you for who you are, my King. We thank you for who we are in you. Thank you for your spirit and your glory and your fire. We thank you for my King that, that it's just the beginning for so many of us, Lord. Just And maybe it's even still freaking us out a little bit. But just being able to step into the kingdom of heaven, not having to wait until I die. Oh, it, well, this is just something you share. It's something you're just making up. But I know, my King, I know that, that within the next week, maybe two, maybe three weeks, we'll begin to understand that this is real. It's as real as what I touch this pulpit in front of me. It's as real as what I have my feet on the ground. It's as real as what I'm holding this mic. Being in your kingdom, walking with you in Eden, eating of the fruit, stepping into Yeshua, spending time with the angelic, going in to the saints of old and communicating with them and them teaching us the things that they've experienced. Father, like the priests would walk through the veil and every priest that has been there uh, before him, you will walk through them. And the revelation and insight of what they carried will just be imprinted in parted into you. Lord, I pray that we'll begin to understand the things that have been hidden, the things that we did not have, the things that we could not perceive, the things that the, the church couldn't teach us because they didn't know it. But now that it's exposed, now that it's open, now that the mysteries is about to get revealed to the body of Christ, Lord, I pray and ask you, my King, that you will enhance our understanding and enhance our revelation of what we know to a place beyond what we can ever begin to fathom or understand. Father, I ask for the, for the saints, the sons and daughters in this room tonight that you will explode into our hearts, Lord, the fullness of your glory. The fullness of your glory and the fire that comes with your glory, Father. And let's be reminded that fire is revelation, wisdom, knowledge, insight from the heart of the Father. It is that it's the mercy seat where the presence of Yahweh is and the two cherubim touch his wings. And all the glory and all the fire and all, all the understanding, all the revelation that comes out of the Father's presence will go into these angelic beings until they are completely filled and, and almost overwhelmed by by all the insight and they would turn their bodies away from the mercy seat and all the revelation will go into creation. Father, it begins with us, your sons and daughters, tonight. As we sit in your presence, we begin to take in all of you and we turn when we are full and all of that revelation goes into creation. Let's begin to understand who we are, my King. We love you, we praise you, we honor you, my King. You're majestic, you are beautiful and we love you, my Lord. Amen. Uh, can someone switch the lights on, please? <laughs> wow. Amen. How are you guys doing? Wonderful. Okay, so I just, I just, I try to frame something for you guys, right? I've had that journey many times in the beginning and I expanded it and it exploded into all kinds of dimensions for me. But, but the idea is that you start somewhere, you find a, a trail to go with. And, you know, and, I, and I understand that, that these methods um, in our perception has uh, been taken from other religions and has been taught to other um, um, believers from other religions. So our perception of this is it's new age, it's not of God, I don't want it. But the, the fact in the matter is that they have stolen it from us. We did not steal it from them. Satan cannot create anything. Satan cannot make anything up. He, he doesn't have the ability. He's a created being and he's two strands. He's not like us. He's not made in the image of, of Yahweh. He doesn't have the full capacity to do what we can do. We are the only creation that has three strand DNA. Body, soul, spirit. Um, animals only has two. Angels only has two. Right? Every other created being, other than the human uh, beings, the Homo sapiens sapien, uh, only has um, two, but we have three. And we have to understand, we are in His image, in His likeness. Other creation cannot do what we can do. But of course, we don't know what we can do, so we just don't do it. And it's been years since anyone has really tapped into it. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying that there's no one tapping into it, because that's not true. There's thousands of Christians tapping out. But how many of you know that according to our understanding, there's millions of Christians? I'm just looking at the charismatic circle where we are tongue-talking, uh, spiritual, born-again believers. There's, there's millions of us, right? And of course, then we have 
the, 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 the normal average Christian Joe walking around that believes in Jesus, there's millions of them. Now the reality is there's levels for everything, right? Now, I remember when I started off in Bible school, um, our mother church had a Bible school and there was about 25 of us that joined. And we started the school. By the time the end of the year came, there was only seven left. That was the first year. Then um, we had to wait a year because a big group of people came in and they wanted uh, to, to start the group together. So we wanted them to finish their first year so that the seven of us can join in with this group and be a bigger group. And there was no rush, so that was fine. But the, by the time we... Um, qualified or graduated, I was the only one in the first group that graduated. There was no one else that was with me in the first group. So out of 25 people, I was the only one that graduated. <coughs> now, we don't really see it like this, but this is how life is. There's a dimension in the kingdom of heaven where you have to press in. It's not just automatically going to happen. That's why Yeshua, he didn't choose the three. They chose him. <coughs> he chose the twelve, but then the three out of the twelve chose to be intimate with him. They walked everywhere he walked. They hanged around him. They were probably like, like, like flies after something nasty. I know that's a ridiculous example, but that's the thing I thought of just now. Okay, because, you know, there's nothing as irritating as a fly, right? You know, and, and, and I guess sometimes that's uh, how they were to him. You know, he, he's like, come on, guys, I just want to be alone for five minutes. I'm going to leave now. I'm going up the mountain to pray. Just leave me alone. Because they made a decision in their hearts. This is the Messiah. I am not going anywhere unless I'm hanging on every word that comes out of his mouth. But the, the other nine didn't do that. Why? See, we don't even understand why. Why wouldn't they? Why is there only uh, uh, th thousands doing what we're doing tonight if there could be millions doing it? Right. You know, why are we not as hungry for the things, the mysteries, the secrets that's out there uh, because we have just been afraid of everything, right? But there will be a company of people in the last days that will go into Mount Zion and be taught by the Lord. And that it will be us. I love that. So what I'm going to try and touch base on tonight, I wanted to start uh, with the glorified man, but I'm, I'm going to rather do the how to grow your spirit so that you guys have some homework. Because the idea is to get your spirit back into fruition regarding who he is. Because we have lost so much memory regarding what the Father has destined for us in being bound to our souls. Now, when you're bound to your soul, you, your soul is in charge and you have a soulish perception. You receive the word through your soul. You understand Yeshua through your soul. You understand Christianity through your soul. It's world, mind, and emotion. Okay, so it depends on how you feel that day. Uh, that's why they say that most pastors want to commit suicide on a Monday. <laughs> because by the time Monday comes, they are drained. And according to your feelings, if that's how you run your life, then you don't want to do this anymore. Because it's not easy. But if you're in the spirit, it's not by works. If you're in the spirit and you operate as a spirit being in, out of the kingdom of heaven, there's no, I'm tired, I need a vacation, this is too much for me. I, I, I'm struggling to focus. I have been doing this every single day for three years nonstop. As a matter of fact, I've been in ministry for 14 years. And I've never been tired of doing it. Now you might say, well, that's you, but, but others get tired. Well, maybe if we understand how to live in the Spirit, we won't get tired. Right. <laughs> I went to bed, I, at, at average I go to bed at half past 11. Half past 11, 12 o'clock. Then I wake up at 4 o'clock. Every day of my life, except Saturdays, uh, yeah, Saturdays and Sundays. So I don't sleep much because I live in the spirit. Now sometimes when I, when I had a, a, a weird week and I'm struggling to get in the spirit and things irritate me or frustrate me or things happen, then I need to sleep more. And that happens. Sometimes your soul wants to reattach itself. 
<laughs> and if you linger around a thought or a frustration or irritation too long, it can happen like that. Because you have a greater memory of your soul being in charge than what you have a memory of your spirit being in charge. How are you guys doing? In Genesis it says this, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, I, we've touched base on this, but I want to go over it again because I need you to understand that um, the, the, the dust of the ground is not what we perceive. It's not the dirt that the trees are planted in outside. Okay, the dirt that's planted outside comes from corrosion. That's logic, right? Yeah. Corrosion is part of sin and death. Okay, so what we were created out of is a, a different substance. As a matter of fact, if you understand the river Pisan, it flows red, right? Now, pure gold in powder form, if thrown into liquid water, it will turn red. So the dust and the, the ground that is found in the kingdom of heaven is what we were, were created out of. So it's a different substance, right? You guys, okay, I just need you to understand that because when, when um, the breath of Yahweh enters man and he becomes a living soul, the fullness of the glory of Yahweh consumes me. I, I want you to understand, everything we're trying to do here is to get back to where Adam and Eve were, but in a different right. creational dimension. Because we are not looking at Adam and Eve, we're looking at Yeshua, but Adam and Eve was more of a visual than what Yeshua was. Because Yeshua, in the mysteries and the secrets, we could go into the Hebrew culture and begin to understand he walked through people. He shifted from his physical image to a spiritual image where they couldn't see him. But when you, and we have to go into the mystery to see that. right? But if you look at Adam and Eve, they didn't have a physical body. Because their physical body and their soul was inside of their spirit. They had to get skinned where Yahweh had to put meat on them skin on them for them to be placed in a physical realm like what we are in now. That happened after they sinned. Now religion has taught us that there was a sacrifice made and an animal was sacrificed. So animal was, was, was killed. I don't know if you have heard that. So the animal was killed. Now why would God kill an animal? First of all, in, in, the, in the understanding of heaven that there was an atonement made, there was a sacrifice made for the sin. And then they took the skin of the animal and placed it on Adam and Eve. Now, we have to understand something. Adam and Eve took fig leaves and covered their nakedness. Right? Yahweh then took, uh, um, he no longer looked at man in the same light because man was no longer covered by him. They were no longer covered by the light. They chose another covering. And because they chose another covering, that is because they, they have traded into the seed of Satan. That's what we did, right? So they could no longer operate in Eden without the blood of Yeshua. Now I remind you, the Bible tells us that Yeshua was slain before the foundations of the earth. That's why we have saints of old, before Yeshua came in his physical form, that's gone into the kingdom of heaven. You have Joshua the high priest, you have Moses, you have all these other men, Enoch, uh, David, that has experienced the kingdom of heaven and had the ability to go in to a place where we have, our perception is it's illegal until we get born again. But how many of you understand the, the blood of Yeshua was shed before the foundations of the earth? So this is how the Father does things. He always creates the end in the beginning. So he doesn't begin anything he hasn't finished first. That's the Hebrew culture. The beginning is here. That's why he says the, the, is the beginning and the end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the Aleph and the Taf. We just need to have that understanding, that background. So once skin was placed on Adam and Eve, their souls came on the outside, their body came on the outside, and their spirit went on the inside. Now there was a physical being, and the glorified spirit was hidden inside. That's why it slowly but surely began to die, because that's what the Bible tells us, right? If you eat of this fruit, you will die. Right. And then they don't die, so God's not a liar, something had to die. Right, so the function of the spirit man was hidden in the physical body and the soul. 
So man it became from a, being a spirit being, he became a human being with a soul and a body. And of course, when I'm born into this earth and the way the earth perceives things, therefore my soul was corrupted by the way I think, understand and feel. And that's why I also run my life according to my feelings. Right? Because that's what the world presents to me. When I get born again, things change. My spirit is again ignited and I begin to change the way I perceive things because my spirit has a memory recall and begins to receive and understand and perceive things again and wants to take charge. Now my soul will fight that. How many of you remember that fight? Yes. When you just got born again, your spirit did not like, like your soul did not like what was happening. Right? There was a, a, a change that had to take place. Your soul now has to submit to your spirit. Your spirit is tired and weak because it's, it's only just gotten up and it's still bound to your soul. So then you're on fire. Oh, And the next minute, I hate this. It's not working for me. Christianity sucks. Bunch of liars. Hypocrites. Help me, Jesus. Right? Or was it just me? No. And we had this massive fight. As a matter of fact, most Christians still have that fight until you divide soul and spirit. Once you divide soul and spirit, the idea is that you just go up. Higher, wider, deeper, every day, all day. Because there's nothing that holds your spirit back. Now you can choose for your soul to come back. Now how many of you know, most of us in the church never raised the dead, in our own understanding of raising the dead, yet most of us raise the dead every day. Remember that, that guy, your old man that died? Yeah. We resurrect him daily. So don't ever tell me you didn't raise the dead. That's right. But the, of course the idea is to not ever again get to that place in your walk where you have to rededicate your spirit to submit, or have submission over your soul and your body. Now I'm, I'm saying that but the logic is in the beginning your soul is just going to want to take over again. And if you don't feed your spirit constantly, then you have to feed your spirit. And if I feed my spirit, I do things that my soul wouldn't naturally want to do, right. like pray. Right. <laughs> That's why the Bible makes a statement. It's a very exciting statement. It says the hypocrite loves to pray. Now, why does the hypocrite love to pray? Because the hypocrite stands, and they talk about the Sadducees and the Pharisees, mm -hmm. right? They are too far to see, and they are sad because they can't see. Right. So they're standing on the street corners because everything they do is religious acts. They are the most holy in the city. They are the ones everybody looks for for spiritual advice. So they have to act holy, they have to act righteous. So they will stand on the street corners and they will speak out loud how wonderful and how great they are and how much they love God and thank you that I'm not like the heathens out there but I worship you and I love you and I'm the sinless fool that loves temple prostitutes. Well, they won't ever pray that out loud, right? Because when the prostitute is caught in adultery, the one that was with her in adultery, I mean, you can't commit adultery by yourself, right? I mean, you can, but that's a whole different story. We need to understand. There was someone involved, but, but he wasn't called out. Why? Because he was probably a religious nut. How are you guys doing? So I need to train my spirit. That's the key. The key is to train my spirit. So if the first thing that we want to kind of understand is important in the growth of your spirit is the issue of meditating. Now I, I know you don't want to misunderstand me because I'm not talking about emptying yourself going hum, 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 with your fingers crossed on your, on, your, on your knees, right? That's not what I'm talking about. You don't want to empty yourself, you want to fill yourself. Now, we have dimensions of the word, so you need to understand when it comes to meditating, a lot of meditation is what we did just now. Uh, having music on that is really just good for your spirit. Now, it could be anything. You know, if you've ever heard frequency music, it sounds very weird. In Hinduism uses frequency music. And we don't like that because that's from another, another religion. Just stay away from it. They must, you know, it's demonic. You know, everything is demonic, right? Well, everything's not demonic. You know, you choose the power that you give to the demonic because they are under your feet, defeated. Right. Uh, Satan cannot have music. Not a sound that comes out of this earth can belong to him. Right. No matter if it's perverted, once it comes into my hands, it is purified. Right. 
because I'm a high priest. And you need to understand this. <laughs> because the high priest would take upon himself the sins of the nation. But before he does, he presents himself to the Father as a sacrifice for the nation, which means if he has sin, he dies. And so does the nation then have a problem. But if he is pure and the Father can, can judge him and take that judgment through him into the nation, the nation is saved. And so I have the ability to judge what the enemy has at hand through the blood of Yeshua and clean it because he is not allowed to have any sound, any frequency and call it his. Now he's had it in his hand for the last 500 years because the body of Christ have chosen to believe that that's his. Magic belongs to the magicians and the Satanists and the New, new Age and, and all the other religions out there that has all these phenomenal, powerful things. You know, in Africa, it's not, it's not uncommon for someone to change into a, a, a bear or for a man to change into a, um, a wolf. It's not common. It's, 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 it's common. People do it. As a matter of fact, in Switzerland, and in Africa, there was newsletters out in the newspaper saying that witches are not allowed to fly higher than 30 meters. And that's about 90 feet. Now, we can't even begin to fathom that, right? Because, first of all, flying is just a, an imaginative thing. It's, a, it's not real. It's not possible. Yet, it's been photographed many times where witches fly. How do they do it? They use the stars and the moon combined with the sun. And the, the astrology out there. Now, if you understand that Satan has skipped the astrology and the sun and the moon, the understanding and the perception of the planets from Christians for so many years by bringing in the whole fortune telling that we do through the stars, right? What do you call that stuff? Horoscope. Sorry? Horoscope. The horoscopes. So what we've been taught is stay away from that stuff. It's from the devil. Uh, as if the devil has any right to it. Yet Jesus, our Savior, the one we worship, he first of all walks on water. Now that's impossible. If you walk on water, you're levitating. Right. Then secondly, he climbs onto a cloud. Now that's another impossibility because you can just move the cloud away. <laughs> right? Because the cloud has no substance. So what he was doing is he was flying. Now we don't understand that and we don't believe that because that's just crazy. No, he wasn't flying. He ascended on a cloud into the heavens. That's how we want to perceive it. That's how we want to understand it. Now, I have to change the Bible's wording, and I'll see that he was flying. He was doing something incredibly supernatural that actually, in my understanding, belongs to the, to, to the, to the enemy. As a matter of fact, Satan tempted Jesus with magic, okay. telling him, I see, you see this rock? Turn it into bread. Now, if I had to take a rock and turn it into bread, the church would think that that's magic and that I'm from the devil. So we need to understand that the, the, the frequencies that's out there that we have claimed belongs to the enemy is literally ours. Right. Now, there's a lot of awesome music out there, healing tones. It's quite amazing. We've got Mark Steen. He has a frequency worship, which is absolutely amazing. But it sounds very weird, but it's, it's a frequency that aligns with the kingdom of heaven. So it enhances the frequency in you and it kind of vibrates inside of you to go deeper into the kingdom of heaven and of course this is all part of meditation right. now we have to understand and I, I want to kind of hammer on this tonight um, the other religions that does and uses meditation they have a key there's a key uh, Buddhists was never meant to become a religion because Buddha was not somebody that wanted to start a new religion like he was a holy man that just wanted to empty himself and uh, he, he was actually a good guy. So after he died, they made it a religion, became, uh, his philosophy became something they worshipped. It was never his intention. But he would meditate on, 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 for days at the end, just eating a rice grain and his own spit. So he wouldn't eat for days, <laughs> just meditating. Now, on what he meditated, I don't know, right? But we cannot say that belongs to the Hindus or the Muslims or the Buddhists. We have to understand that meditation is something the Father's always wanted us to do. Meditation is what opens up my mind because I have the mind of Christ. Now, you might not have the full mind of Christ, 
<coughs> but I get the mind of Christ through studying and meditating on the Word of God. Because the, the Logos is literally the mind of God. You guys understand what I'm saying? So the Logos, which is the written, it's the mind of God. So as I meditate it, I begin to understand the way God thinks. But of course I have to meditate it and, and uh, study it out of the original text. Now we're actually the only religion that does not read the original text. Matter of fact, we are the only religion that uses their, um, their, their ancient book in multiple different translations. So we literally don't know whether the translation we're reading is accurate or not. As a matter of fact, I'll go as far as to say, and as much as I love most translations, I really don't have any issues with translation, the one translation that we use more often than any other is the King James Version. The King James Version is one of the only translations that tells us that all imaginations are not is wrong. The original doesn't even mention the word imagination. The, the, the other translations mainly says vain imaginations. Imaginations that's, that's not of God. Right. That makes it a little bit easier for me to say, well then if there's imaginations that's not of God, that's an abomination, then I can imagine things and it could be from God. But if, because we all read one Bible, one translation, a the and a thou, that, that is outdated, and if you understand the translation that took place when they translated it, you'd probably not even read it anymore. But I'm not going to go into that because I could get stoned, literally. Because if you didn't know it, there's people that actually worship the King James Bible. Yep. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. It is insane. There's no other Bible, no other translation but the King's, King James. But if you understand, if you read the interlinear Bible, it changes everything because it's directly translated from the Hebrew and the Greek. And the Greek's not even completely original, but it changes everything that we believe because the translation is different. I just want you to understand. So when I meditate... The idea of meditation is to go into a specific uh, section of the word and remind yourself the word's not just something that I read out of the book. The word is also the, the living and the word is also that which has been spoken. So I can go into all three of that dimensions of the word and have it soak over me and in me. And it literally opens up the gates in me. The Bible says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then in Psalms it says, Here I am, I have come, in the scroll of the book it is written about me. So the idea is to meditate on that which he's already spoken. To meditate on that which came out of him. And of course to meditate on him. The second key, and I say keys, but it's not really keys. It's just, it's just steps that you need to take. And it's not really even steps. I'm not trying to give you a method. The method is worship. The method is to glorify and magnify Him. The method is to step into Him and to love Him. Right? But the idea is to, when you step into Him, to meditate on the Word. To meditate on Him. To go on a journey where you have your train of thought focused on what you're really doing. Because what we do is we will want to pray out loud. And when we do pray out loud, and don't get offended with me, but the truth is we just pray a bunch of rubbish. We repeat ourselves over and over again. We don't really know what we're saying. We're just rambling words. And it's not really what the Father wants. Now, I can't speak to my wife like that. If you can't speak to your wife the way you pray, don't do it. Now, I'm not saying that God is to be my husband. because That's another myth of the church that's not the truth. But I am saying that if I want an intimate relationship with God, I'm not just going to ramble things off. Because if I ramble things off, my wife is going to stand there like this. You're not really talking to me, are you? You're just rambling a bunch of words off and it's not making any sense. Why? What did you do? <laughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> See, there has to be understanding regarding this. How are you guys doing? <clears throat> so, we will also have to look at the idea of building my spirit is to constantly be in worship. Now, I want you to step away from your perception of worship. Because worship is not something I do. Worship is something I am. Okay, I am worship. He created me to worship Him. I don't go out to worship Him. I live a life that's worship unto Him. 
That's why I don't have to go find a spot and uh, bow my knees and raise my hands. I don't have to clap and jump. And I'm not saying don't do that stuff because you would like and want your soul and your body involved in what your spirit's doing on occasions. Right? But the idea of worship is that everything you do is worship unto Him. You know, if you, if you go to the gym, you go there because you bring worship unto the Father. If I spend time with my wife, no matter which way we spend time together, it's worship unto God. If I spend time with my kids, it's worship unto God. If I drive in my car, it's worship unto God. If I go to the shop, it's worship unto God. Now, I know you're there, well, what, you're just smoking your socks, brother. But the idea is that every act that comes from me brings worship to my Father. Of course, and you'll quickly understand that when you're in the kingdom of heaven, everything you do in the kingdom of heaven brings glory to Him. And I've said and touched base on this before, but the logic behind it is that if I go to a restaurant and I eat the food that the chef made and I enjoy the food, I am bringing glory to the chef. I'm not bringing glory to the food. So as I enjoy that which the, the chef has made, I bring glory to Him. So when I'm in the kingdom of heaven, I do not have to worship my father all the time to be in his, in his presence and to worship him. I can be in the kingdom and I can do all kinds of things. I can, I can engage with, with, with the saints of old. I can engage with the men who are I can engage with the angelic. I can engage with the seven spirits. I can go into different courts and begin to... I can, matter of fact, I can sit in one court for five years and not do anything and it will be worship unto the Lord. But we don't understand that, but in the same breath, my spirit within the kingdom of heaven can multiply and do several things at the same time, which will then come to one place in the kingdom and it will be downloaded into my soul as infused knowledge. But that happens in soaking and meditation. It happens in worship and adoration. How are you guys doing? Because John makes a statement and says, God is the spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, I would almost go as far as to push it as hard as I can and say that the church up to this point has hardly worshipped God. <laughs> because we don't know how to go in the Spirit. We know how to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. But we don't know how to operate in the Spirit. So what we believe is when we operate in the gifts of the Spirit, we're in the Spirit. No, you're not in the Spirit. You're in the Spirit when you're in the Spirit. That's the logic of it. I'm in this room because I'm in this room. There's no other way to say it. When I walk out of this room, I'm no longer in this room because I walked out of this room. But when I'm in the Spirit, I'm in the Spirit because I'm actually in the Spirit. Not because I think I'm in the Spirit. I'm in the Spirit because my spirit and my soul is divided. I'm aware of my spirit being. I'm aware of the fact that I am spirit. It has a soul that lives in a body. And when my spirit moves, my body doesn't, doesn't naturally has to move. I can, I can stand here and look at you guys and my spirit can stand over there. You can't see it, but I'll, I'll tell you something. My spirit is a burning flame. A burning fire. My spirit uh, looks like me, but it doesn't have skin on it. It doesn't have actual features. There's no, there's no chest. There's no shoulders per se. It is a blue flame on the outside that burns very mildly. And on the inside, it is orange, red, and yellow flames burning vigorously. Mm -hmm. uh, my eyes are slightly blue with fire in it. My whole being is enlightened. I don't walk per se. I float. It is, it is a dimension of who I am in the image of Yahweh that I can't express. My spirit steps on the outside, goes into the kingdom of heaven, and it, it's consumed by the glory of the Father. It comes back into my body, and I open it up so it can bring the presence into the earth. You might not feel it, because how many of you understand, God doesn't go anywhere. Right? He doesn't have to go anywhere. He's omnipresent. Right? But there's places where His fullness is in a greater measure. How are you guys doing? So once I begin to understand that I can do all of this, and because my spirit has opened up and his presence in the surroundings has intensely increased, you might not experience that because you're not aware of his presence. You're not aware of your spirit because that's not something we've been taught. It's not something that you have framed. I mean, I take you on a journey tonight, but it might be your first time. You might have experienced this before and it's not your first time. It's something you understand, but it might be something you just don't understand. And you need more education. What I had to do, and I literally had to do this, I had to listen to these messages my mentors taught over and over and over until it felt like there was a glitch in my... It was really that bad. 
because my soul just wouldn't allow me to understand it. But it was, it, was, it was something I had to push into for years. I'm talking five, six years. I was, I'd wake up at five in the morning and I would sit with him for hours, just going into the kingdom of heaven, just walking, experiencing the seven spirits, just studying the word, meditating on it, listening to these messages over and over again. <clears throat> and if you understand Ian Clayton and Justin Abraham and these guys, they don't break it up into smaller portions, like the sons and the daughters would do it. Because every, every mentor has a way of teaching, and his sons and daughters will teach in a way that they perceive it. And then so it will happen and will go on. That's why we have uh, an understanding of the word today in a different measure than what it was taught then. Why? Because we've broken up into smaller portions. So I've taken a lot of Ian's teachings and what he's taught me and what I've engaged in through those teachings, and I've broken it up into smaller portions to make great sense. Now maybe it doesn't make more sense, but it makes more sense to me. <laughs> So maybe that's why if you listen to Rebecca, she's broken what I teach, even smaller portions. That's why she comes in and she teaches with me every now and then, because I look at, 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 at uh, beautiful faces that looks like this. <laughs> and I understand that uh, it's just not being perceived. I've understood it, in New Orleans, we've been with you for three years, and there's still uh, many in that class that just can't see. It's, it's literally like something just has to click inside of you. But it all comes with, with pushing in. <laughs> Perseverance, and meditating, worship. Going in as deep as you can. Then of course, fellowship. Now you have to understand, I'm not talking about uh, staying after church and visiting with cake and tea. That's nice, but that's not what I'm talking about. Engaging with people that believe the same as you do. That experience and walk in the same stuff as you do. Now, I'm not saying leave your church and go to a church that does that, because then you're not going to find a church, you're not even going to be in church. Right? The idea is to, to find a group of people, whether it's online, whether it is coming here, that can communicate in the same measure as what you want to grow in. Because the idea is, and this is really key to everything, never to leave the church you're in. Never. But the idea is always to grow and mature and then go back in and expand your spirit over the pastor, over the leaders, over the church itself, so that you can expand and change them. Because what you have in your heart, you can change. I've never urged anybody to leave the church. I've been in the same church since I got born again. I got born again out of the Dutch Reformed Church. I leave that church when I got born again. And I started going to the mother church that I'm still involved with today. They still sent me Texas. Texas. Uh, uh, tax. <laughs> that sounds like a state in America, dude. You can't say that. Um, they still sent me messages. They still, we're still in contact. I'm still, I wouldn't say under their covering, but I am, I am in fellowship with them extremely and excessively. Right. right? And um, I've been in that church for 20, 23 years. Never left the church. I left it every time I had to go study somewhere else. I studied at Hadfield Christian Church. It's a mega church in Pretoria. Johannesburg, South Africa. I left it, but I didn't leave it. I just, you know, when you study uh, at a Bible school, they prefer you to be in that church. And I remember I was in Ramah for a couple of years. I was in Hatfield for a couple of years. Then, of course, we planted a church, and I was um, teaching my father's, my spiritual father's Bible school. And I, I, I was in the mother church that I planted with my pastor, and we grew that for almost 10 years. But still under, under the, the supervision of the church that I've been in since I got born. So I never urge anybody to, to leave a church, but to grow as far as you can and then to begin to have people that you associate as your sons and your daughters, people that you have close-knitted friends that's at the same level as you, and then of course you have to have mentors that's at another level, higher than you. That's just the key to, to have an understanding. That's why people are so important, because iron sharpens iron. You know, and, and of course you have to be very... Um, clever with who you share what with, right? There's a time and a, and a season for everything. Now, sometimes we get so excited with what we experience, we just want to share. But let me tell you something, 90% of the things we share today, now not everybody, I mean, we've got some phenomenal pastors, amazing men and women out there that's open, that perceives, that understands. But we also have a measure of leaders that's just completely shut for anything that's new, anything that's outside of their box or perception of things. So I go share my experience with somebody, I've gone into heaven, and I walk with the seven spirits, I engage with, with one of the angels, <clears throat> and his name is Zariel, and I can just hear that pastor go, that is not from God. Where do you see that in the Bible? That is from Satan. 
cut that off now and, and keep going according to the word. Well, that's according to the word, exactly as the word would want it to be, but our perception of the word is different because of what we were taught. So that can shut you down completely. It can knock off your crown and stop you dead in your tracks. And the growth that was supposed to take place can be nullified. That's why you have to watch what you say, when you say, where you say. Now, it's not secrets. I want to keep it in and, and, well, you know, I don't want to tell anybody about this because, you know, no one will understand. Now, people understand because the spirit of man wants this. As a matter of fact, the spirit of man runs after it. It's the soul that goes, no, where's that in the word, brother? I don't like that. Where did you get that? That's not true. I've never seen or experienced anybody do that. Do you do that? Well, you can't preach something that you don't experience yourself. See, there has to be at least a measure of all these things that you experience. Mm -hmm. You have to touch base on everything. Every time I heard one of my mentors say something that I didn't understand, or say something that was just too far out for me to grasp, I went into it. Because it's, it's, if, if it's truly spirit, then my spirit can go into it. Just like the Word. When I read the Word, I go into the Word. See, the idea behind everything I teach you is that your spirit has to become a primary focus. Because if I'm focused on my spirit, I'll be aware of what my spirit does. If I'm aware of what my spirit does, the download from my soul, my spirit to my soul is easier. And soaking them, they just become a, a um, time to rest, a time to sleep, a time to think of everything else but God. It becomes a time of focus and deep, deep intimacy with the Father. But of course, we have to be around the right people. Right? That's always a good idea. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Good. Um, praying in tongues. Hmm. Now, how many of you, is there anyone that does not pray in tongues in this room? You do not pray in tongues. Do you want to pray in tongues? Yes. Okay. Now, the key here is, we'll pray for you just now. <laughs> the idea, and it's so simple, it's ridiculously simple. Do you pray in tongues, young lady? So, the idea behind praying in tongues, of course, is the fact that it's something that's already there. It's not something that you have to try and do. It's not something that you have to pray and beg God, please, I want to pray in tongues. I've done that. I did that. Crying, snot, and tears. I remember, um, I don't know what happened. I pulled something out of my cupboard, and this bottle of, uh, I don't know what it was, acid of some kind. It was my, bro my brother passed away. Um, when I was in matric, I gave my life to Jesus the, 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 the year after I, part, I finished school. Um, so I, took, I lived in his room, and he had some stuff up in his cupboard, and all my clothes, I'm, I'm not the neatest guy on the planet, but as a young man, all my clothes was lying in front of my cupboard, because yeah, I couldn't find what I wanted to wear. You know how it is, right? And I remember putting something in this massive bottle of, I don't know what, fell onto my clothes and burned a hole through all my clothes. And I was so depressed, so frustrated, I just left it there. And I remember uh, eventually while I was busy praying and worshiping God, I fell on my knees on this pile of, I don't know what it was. I, I really don't know what it was. There's some kind of a fluid that you put in your car or in your motorbike. And I was sitting on this, and it was weird smelling, and I was kind of getting high, I think, I don't know. But I was crying and I was screaming, telling God that I want to pray in tongues. Why can't I pray in tongues? Why is it so difficult? Why is it so hectic? And I remember in that time, I, I said, well, I just want one word. And he gave me a word, and it was Kaparakadish. And of course, that was just ridiculous, because in my language, para is frog. And you know, dish is like a pan. So in my natural understanding, I, say, I said, well, I can't say frog in a dish. That's just stupid. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. But I was urged to continue to say that, Kaparakadish in the way that I'm supposed to say it as it is. And I just kept on doing it. Kaparakadish, 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 Kaparakadish. By faith, it sounded like a retard, felt like a retard, and really didn't want to do it. But I felt every time I did it, something shifted and changed in me. And I remember sitting in church one night, and uh, I was saying Kaparakadish, but kind of softly, because there's now more people around me, and it sounds ridiculous. And uh, the next sentence, I guess, I got was, was uh, Shara Kabanda. Now, Shara sounds a lot like Kara, and Banda is actually uh, the word in Afrikaans for tires. And kara is cars. So now I have a frog in a pan and I've got tars, cars tires. And, and it just freaks me out. And I don't want to say it too loud. And I remember saying that for, for months at an end. Just in myself. Just, and I just not, never stop praying. Just doing it all the time. 
Eventually, I kind of became aware of it, and it was easier because it wasn't so it didn't sound so bad anymore. And if you ever realize, if you say one word enough times fast, it kind of changes and doesn't make sense anymore. So luckily, that happened because I said it so often. But I remember standing on the rugby field in South, in, in South Africa at Bible school, just worshiping God all my soul. There was no one near me, and all of a sudden, this, this Sharakabana Kaparakadish just exploded into a language. And from that day on, I just continue to pray in tongues as often and as much as I can. And the key is that we begin to understand that it's not a language. The Bible says it's a heavenly language, but we have to understand heaven itself operates out of a frequency. Everything, everything is frequency. Everything, that's what Holy Spirit did before the creation started. He hovered over at the earth. What is hovering? Hovering is frequency. That's the same thing that Yahweh did before Mary fell pregnant. He hovered over her. That's a frequency release. So when I start praying in tongues, Rambor Maria Bagaru Shizeketra Star Kendra, if I slow it down, Rambor Bar Beba Eosh Ora Zurgondonu Stabrian Nanando, I understand there's actually a sound. And it's the sound that comes from my spirit because my soul thinks, cuckoo, cuckoo, the nuts out. And maybe not your soul, but that's what my soul thinks. And now while I'm saying, my soul's thinking, did you say that right? Did you pronounce that the right way? It comes out so fast, do you even know what you're saying while it comes out so fast? You know, my soul's just like, what? But the key of all of this is that it's a frequency that comes from my spirit that aligns with the kingdom of heaven. So when I pray in tongues, my spirit is edified. Right? I am receiving mysteries and secrets directly from the Father's heart because there's an alignment of the frequency of heaven with the frequency of my spirit that opens up a gate that takes me deeper into the Father. Now, I wouldn't say that it's, it's an essential because you're not going to go to hell if you don't speak in tongues, but it's an essential for your growth. Right. And of course, the understanding is that it's already there. The only reason you don't speak it is because you don't understand it. Because you have a wrong perception of it. I remember I was in the gym just the other day, a couple of weeks ago, and a, a gentleman that I prophesied over, you know, people are really freaked out when you just walk up to them and you start speaking mysteries of their lives to them. And I'm speaking to this young man. I knew he was a Christian just because of what I saw around him. And so um, I spoke to him and prophesied over him and we became really good friends. He came to a couple of my meetings. And I remember going into the bathroom just to get ready to start my training. And he came in behind me and he started telling me about this friend of his who just came into the gym. And he wants me to just go speak to him about speaking in tongues. Because he's been a Christian for a long time. He's struggling to speak in tongues. He doesn't understand. He says it's just not happening for him. So I went in there and I just started speaking to him. I basically uh, kind of expressed and explained to him that it's not a gift. It's not one of the nine gifts. How many of you believe that it's one of the nine gifts? Okay, so that's a good sign. <laughs> because it's not a gift. It's not one of the nine, nine gifts. And we have to understand that. Because if you have the mentality that it's one of the nine gifts, then you might not be uttered to speak. But I don't need, now that sounds terrible, I, of course I need Holy Spirit. But I don't need Holy Spirit to utter me to speak in tongues. I can speak in tongues anytime, any, any day, whenever I want to, in whichever way, fashion, or form I want to, no matter what. No one can stop me from speaking in tongues. Right, but I can't, I, I can, but I, if I was operating only in the gifts, I can't prophesy whenever I want to. I can't see words of wisdom, words of knowledge whenever I want to, right, because it's uttered by the Holy Spirit. But the two gifts that we understand is to, is, is to be tongues is the one that says, um, we'll speak in other tongues. That's a language I didn't learn. Like all of a sudden I start speaking French or Chinese. That's the, the, the tongues they're talking about. Then, of course, the interpretation is where someone can interpret my tongue, my heavenly language. That's a gift. But the evidence of being filled with Holy Spirit is speaking in other tongues. Because that's where the frequency lines up. He who speaks in tongues um, edifies and improves himself. I would urge you to speak in tongues as often as you can. Now, teach yourself to do it in a mutterance. Does that make sense? Yeah. I don't even know if there's a word like that. <laughs> you know, but just like a, where your, your mouth moves, but there's no sound coming out, or your mouth, mouth might not even move. Just a, a subconscious sound coming f through your nostrils as you pray in tongues with, with no one having to know. No one sees it. No one can feel it. It's just something you do constantly. Keep yourself aware. Yeah, I do that. You do that? I do well, that. Well, then you do speak in tongues. Now just make it verbal every now and then so that that word can come out. Because there's more power in speaking a word out because the frequency is louder and so the frequency will begin to align with heaven. That will open up an excess 
of, of what you have experienced. It will, it will increase it. So that is, that, that is tongues. But see, because we don't understand what tongues is, that is tongues. You have it, you got it, just start doing it more often because it's in you already. When I started speaking in tongues, it was funny because we would used to get really drunk and we would talk gibberish to each other. Do you guys know what that is? Yeah. We just make up a weird language. Because we'll sit in, in a club and there will be people around us and we'll start talking poop. And he will say something weird and people will look at us as if we're from another country. When I started speaking in tongues, I used some of those words. And I was like, I'm making this stuff up. <laughs> because I've already spoken it. But then I have a lady friend who wasn't born again. She was a Roman Catholic. She walks in the, in the, in the field with her, with her son. They're just going for a, a, a walk in the woods. And um, they're speaking gibberish to each other. And while she's speaking gibberish to her son, she stops realizing that what she was doing right there was heavenly language. She was speaking in tongues. This is what she understood as a Roman Catholic. Then she gets born again, gives her life to Jesus because she spoke in tongues, and then she got baptized afterwards. How do you explain that? That's the power of speaking in tongues. Because it's a frequency alignment that opens up the heavens. So I would urge you to speak as often and as loud as you can. You know, uh, there's a time where I don't speak loud at all, but when I'm alone in my car or when I'm driving, when there's no one around me, when I'm alone in my house, I speak in tongues as loud as I can. I don't scream it like a crazy person, but you can, because we are crazy, right? How are you guys doing? <laughs> okay, then of course, the idea is that we speak the Word of God out loud. Declare and decree. Now, I'm saying not just the written word, but also the spoken word. So prophecy. I remember a friend of mine, where he received a prophecy that said that Satan's going to try and kill you, but he will not be able to. Months, I'm talking two months later, after that prophecy was given, he is in a massive accident, two people in the car, um, him and another friend of mine. The friend of mine didn't have a prophecy to stand on, didn't have a word. The exact same injuries, both of them. One died, one lived. While the one was in a coma, um, his mother took that prophecy and she declared it and decreed it every day over him. And it healed him. He healed because of the word that was spoken over him. So I need you to begin to understand, you take those prophecies, the things that the Father has said to you, the word of God that was illuminated to you, and speak it out into the atmosphere as hard and as often as you can. Exciting, right? Yeah. Let's stand. How are you guys doing? Great. So, Father, we just want to thank you and praise you and glorify and magnify your awesome name. Father, I want, to, I want to ask that everyone in this room will begin to have a greater dimension of understanding just from regarding these things. And I know it's so fresh. I know it's so fresh to the church, although it's not fresh to so many. It's, 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 it's almost baby talk to some. But, Father, in reality, the, the church has not caught up. And so, Father, I pray that you will open our hearts to begin to receive. I pray that you'll open our heart to begin to believe the thanks that has been spoken, Father. <coughs> and we'll begin to run after what you have made available for us. We will engage into all of these and every aspect of it. We'll understand we go into the heavens to receive from you. We'll go into the heavens to speak and to align our frequency, Father. We'll begin to understand the beauty of your creation and engaging into it, Father. I ask that you'll open up the hearts of everyone in this room, that you will begin to pour into everyone every, every aspect of what we need for right now as the Ecclesia. Pour into us, but in the same breath, give us the desire to run into it with full force, yeah. to open our hearts, to present ourselves to you as a living sacrifice, and to have your spirit and your glory consume us. Father, we love you, we praise you, in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Oh, my God.